Hi, everyone. I am Joy Williams. And like I have mentioned before, and hopefully you all remember, I am a divinity student at Wake Forest University in Winston Salem, North Carolina. And if you haven't had a chance to go to my blog, please do at healingjoinministries.wordpress.com. And I'll put it in the comment as well. But I am very excited um, to have someone join me today. And I'll have him introduce himself, but I'm really I'm excited because he brings a different perspective to the conversation of faith, sex, and sexuality, and what does faith have to do with our politics. So, um, Logan, please introduce yourself, and thank you for joining. Yeah, no, I'm uh, very happy. I was very eager to uh, try to do this kind of thing. Um, so, my name is Logan Willis, and uh, I am also a divinity student. I'm a first-year uh, divinity student at uh, Wake Forest University School of Divinity. So. Uh, I'm very excited to just do this interview because, um, yeah, I think my uh, my thoughts on faith and 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 politics and how they relate are going to be helpful. I hope. I hope. Yay! Well, why don't you go ahead and tell us what is your faith? What is your theology? Right. Okay. Um, so. Uh, oh, sorry. In a nutshell, okay. theology can be complex. But. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how long do we have? Right. Um, so. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was raised Southern Baptist. I uh, went to a Southern Baptist church for um, a, a, like 18 years of my life. And um, uh, after a while, I, you know, had conflicts with uh, uh, Christianity and, uh, you know, every all the ideas that come with that. Uh, I grew up in a very conservative church. Um, so I became atheist for a while. Uh, but now I uh, have found uh, a lovely spiritual home in the traditions, in the Eastern traditions of Buddhism, Taoism, and Hinduism. But today, uh, I'll stick with uh, just uh, Buddhism for now. That is super interesting. So I just knew about the Buddhism connection. I didn't realize there was this whole Eastern philosophy approach that you have combined. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little bit more, if you don't mind, about your journey from Southern Baptist to atheism to how did you land on Eastern religions? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So um, like, it, well, so I was uh, raised in a Southern Baptist church and uh, I started to, through music, uh, it kind of opened up my spirituality where I really wanted to focus on God and the important really important things in life so um i started studying listening to pastors reading the bible myself um and i eventually came to uh a, a kind of denomination a a, a feel a systematic theology called calvinism uh which uh, i thought was very biblical which is important to me um but it actually turned out for me and my personal experience to be very toxic to my spirituality and for spiritual growth um, although I followed it very rigorously uh, the entire time, but it eventually caused uh, all kinds of problems. For example, I really couldn't know whether or not I had any salvation or not. So that was uh, a very real difficulty for me. At the same time, I was uh, always enjoyed debate. So I listened to debates from Christians and atheists, uh, all kinds of, mostly Christians and atheists. Um, and uh, from that, I... And, and actually, you know what, with the debates, uh, there was like maybe one Eastern tradition kind of person, or at least someone outside of the fold of Christianity and atheism. And I always viewed him as kind of hokey, kind of very strange. <laughs> so uh, I never really considered that position to be tenable at all or helpful for my own spiritual growth. So I largely ignored it. Once I started having these doubts, I became an atheist, uh, which had its own you know, kind of rebellion, you know, teenage angsty kind of rebellion stuff, which really fit well for me. I fit into the new atheism uh, pretty well. Uh, listen to Dawkins and Sam Harris and people like that. Um, and then I came across uh, a kind of a kind of cinematic trailer for something. And I was listening to the guy on there and he was talking about some concepts that sounded really spiritual to me. Uh, but I really wasn't familiar with it, and I listened to it, and I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. And so I just listened to it more and found the uh, the person who was speaking, and uh, he started talking about Christianity and Buddhism and Taoism and all these different thought uh, beliefs that I had never heard of before. 
and I slowly became convinced uh, about the, these kind of spiritual practices or and these spiritual beliefs that I had largely discredited before, and it just before I knew it, without him even trying to convince me, because he's dead and he never uh, considered himself to be a kind of person to convince someone. Uh, so I, I just ended up falling in love with the tradition. Uh, the person I'm talking about, by the way, is his name is Alan Watts, and that's just the person that you're going to be hearing a lot of influences from today if you listen to me. So. Okay. Okay. I had um, a question about... And I don't, because I know we don't have a lot of time, um, and I really want to dig in into how this new thought pattern um, has influenced something like politics for you. But I'm also very interested, just very quickly, if you want to say more about um, how this has answered questions around salvation, or is there a heaven or hell? Like, is this new Eastern philosophical approach is it a philosophy or is it in fact a religion i have heard both and that it um can be a lifestyle and people can be a christian and a buddhist at the same time so i'm very curious about your understanding and your practice in terms of these questions that you brought up like salvation <clears throat> excuse me okay uh yeah excellent so so with politics uh you, you also asked me whether or not um uh buddhism has a is liberal or conservative uh, and I guess the answer is kind of yes. Uh, so uh, the particular Buddhism that I subscribe to is uh, in in a large uh, stream is is Mahayana Buddhism, um, and more particularly the strain of Mahayana I subscribe to is Zen Buddhism, which you've probably heard of before. So so Mahayana is pretty. Uh, kind of in the middle, which Buddhists love. Buddhists love the middle way. So uh, it's kind of in the middle, I would say. I don't know very much about the other um, the other uh, parts of Buddhism, but if I have to guess, I would say that uh, Thera Theravada, which is the oldest uh, continuated form of Buddhism, uh, I would say that's probably more uh, conservative based on the things that I've heard about and how they approach um for example, enlightenment, which is kind of the uh, salvation of uh, Buddhism, although that is uh, very much a simplification. Um, and then uh, the other, the third form of uh, Buddhism is uh, Vajrayana, Vajrayana, and uh, I don't know very much about that, but that seems to be the most liberal, I would say, uh, form of Buddhism. I would, I would guess. Um, so there's there's that it's it's um, and how it's informed my politics is uh, really interesting. Um, I would uh, I would say that's a very large discussion to have. Um, I really appreciate the middle way. Uh, I do consider myself really liberal right now. Uh, so I'm not. I used to consider myself uh, conservative. I used to consider myself liberal. I used to consider myself moderate. But I'd say right now I'm pretty liberal because seems like the, the tide is in favor of uh, conservatives, at least in terms of power right now. So I'm trying to balance that out a little bit. So so you're looking at it in terms of politics of what's needed. So if, if the politics were more liberal, would you say you would then be a more conservative to kind of get that middle, if Buddhists like the middle way, so to speak? Is that what I'm hearing? That's a good point. Um, well, I guess it would depend on uh, what kind of liberalism and what kind of conservatism has power and what's influencing things at the moment. Um, uh, I'm down to my core. I'm, I'm very uh, LGBTQIA+. Uh, so if anybody were to go against anything like that, I'm very much not in favor of that kind of politics. So, um, But it's not necessarily who has power, what's needed, but um, I, I also enjoy the flourishing of human life. So whatever's cultivating that is, is what's most important for me. So. Okay. And so uh, what about salvation? Right. Like what? Yes. So I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that. So uh, enlightenment is, um, is a very, uh, is, is kind of the goal. Uh, and even goal, I, I'm hesitant to say goal as if like, it's something that we have to progress to. Or, and even even that symbol right there of just going up, like enlightenment is, but I, so I don't very much subscribe to uh, kind of um, progressing as if you need to get to this thing. Uh, it's more the idea of if that is something that you want, 
if that's something that you feel would help you uh, live a more calm and peaceful and generous life, then I can try to help you give you resources and help you figure that out along with myself. So uh, that that's just a distinction to make. It's absolutely not a thing of if you don't complete that, um, you're going to burn in hell forever. That's certainly not uh, the kind of Buddhism that I subscribe to, although there has been a view uh, similar to that in Buddhism before by other schools of thought. So for me personally, uh, with regard to salvation and, and how I was before kind of worried about my salvation, I want to uh, read a, a quote, a real quick quote from uh, my spiritual uh, teacher, instructor, uh, Alan Watts. Uh, and he said, a Buddha would see you as being exactly right. Just where you are, all of you are Buddhas. Even for those of you who don't know it, it is right for you not to know it at this moment. So I think that's very important um, that to know that uh, in my theology, everyone has the spirit, uh, everyone has the Buddha nature. So uh, enlightenment is attainable for everyone. And if you don't get it, if you don't wake up uh, in this life, that's completely fine. It wasn't your time to do it, and uh, uh, no one should ever kind of force you to um, to do that. So, and, and for me personally, it's a really good thing to know for me personally that I don't have to get this done. It, and if I don't do it, then something terrible will happen to me or I've lost out an opportunity. That's not the idea at all uh, in terms of uh, Buddhism. And, and there's nothing I can do to even lose it. Uh, and it's kind of just going to be completely gained through uh, no act of effort by myself. It kind of just flows to you naturally. And when you get it, you just get it. So I, I really enjoy that aspect of the salvation uh, enlightenment idea of Buddhism. Yeah, it really takes the pressure off of <laughs> behaving or earning something if that is um, a part of how you understood salvation before. So I can, I can understand um, the relief and what you talk about. All right, so let's dig in a little bit about how this affects um, politics. So you mention a little bit about um, your views on liberalism and conservatism. And so in general, I'm curious, do Buddhists tend to be more in a particular political expression? Like, is that, I'm, I'm not sure. So I'm, I'm guessing if it's anything like Christianity, which is my faith background and what I'm most familiar with, then you have Christians that are liberal and they use the Bible very well in that area, or you have, Christians that are conservative and they use the Bible very well in that area. So is it something like Buddhism too? Like when you talk about politics, you have Buddhists that has this alignment thought and they use that thought towards these issues or, you know, one direction or the other. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, so I don't have much um, knowledge about how uh, Buddhists usually work in the world, especially with uh, regard to politics. I know how I'm going to behave. Um, and I'm really, I want to try really hard not to give you a non-answer to this, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so with that said that I, I don't have much interaction with, uh, uh, any other, uh, Buddhist, um, I will say that it would seem to me based on what I do know about Buddhism that, um, that there might be people who are activists that would, um, uh, help, um, uh, certainly, uh, Buddhists do get involved to some degree, uh, uh, you have the Buddha who um, uh, you have uh, the Buddhist who um, set himself on fire as a form of political protest. I think it was in the 80s. Um, so certainly Buddhists do get involved in some ways. Uh, however, I'm sure that a lot of them uh, would refrain from uh, getting tied up too closely in things uh, similar to that because they're uh, they're erring on the side of not causing themselves additional suffering. Uh, at the same time, it's also uh, the role of uh, someone, if someone's taking the role of a, a bodhisattva, um, uh, who is a person who has uh, either reached enlightenment or has uh, gone uh, very far through the process to reach enlightenment, that they decide to help others along the path to enlightenment and therefore decrease in suffering. So I could absolutely see how a Buddhist uh, bodhisattva would see that as a way of seeking to engage and encouraging themselves to engage in a political um, uh, political activism or something like that. 
hope I gave you a kind of an answer there. Right? Um, what it sounds like is that based on your maybe reading knowledge or through conversational knowledge, because you did say that you don't, you're not in really community with other Buddhists mm -hmm. um, to know like how they may behave or how they may vote. Right. Um, but it sounds like voting from a Buddhist perspective, it's approach, how can I help other people be enlightened mm -hmm. or can I best express my enlightenment in this mm -hmm. world? Is that kind of, so that's kind of yes. like the motivation factors. So yes. instead of a text, they're using their understanding of enlightenment. Yes, I would say so. I would also say that um, a, a crucial uh, a, a crucial idea in Buddhism is suffering, and the goal of uh, Buddhists is to um, to cause as little suffering as possible, to cause as little harm as possible. So, if there was um, someone who was advocating for something that would cause harm to other people, it would make um, total sense to me that a Buddhist would see that as a uh, as a a call to end that suffering as much as possible. So at, at the same time, they would seek to not get involved. But if there was something that a Buddhist felt strongly about, I could definitely see how uh, they would be encouraged to uh, get rid of that suffering if they could. With okay, well, I have with what have you? Yeah. So what about the issue of abortion? Because that is a very hot topic around voting season when it comes to Christians. And right. so with of abortion it's always do we do we defend the mom do we defend the baby or do we like what so what is the conversation when you talk about suffering um in that sense right uh that's a really good question so um i i hesitate to uh, make any kind of judgment about what other buddhists would do or what the predominant view in buddhism is but for myself i will say um that Abortion is a is a very complicated issue uh, that involves um, uh, and I've I've looked into a lot of debate about abortion and how to kind of solve that problem. Um, so, uh, for me, uh, I look at it as um, very much a bodily rights issue, um, and I I take into consideration um, how developed uh, or how much suffering is going to occur from abortion and from not an abortion, uh, or from, uh, you know, the pro-life position and the pro-choice position. So it's, uh, it's a very complicated topic. For me personally, I fall into the pro-choice um, uh, side of the debate because uh, it would seem like an extended period of suffering that could, that could possibly be occurring uh, with an unwanted pregnancy uh, being uh, brought to full term and having that baby, even for putting it up for adoption, that's still going to cause a lot of suffering for the mother and for the um, uh, the child, the child involved. So, um, I'm sorry, were you saying something? I, I just said possibly, but I'm 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 tracking yeah, you. I mean, it could. It, I mean, uh, yeah. there's all kinds of. Uh, possibilities that could happen with uh, an unwanted pregnancy continuing the mother could change their mind um all kinds of things that could happen uh in that situation but i err on the side of caution for the bodily rights aspect of it in terms of being able to uh control your own reproductive system and mm -hmm. um uh so yes but it, it's a very complicated issue and if if we get in if, if someone were to bring minutia the very you know, minutia of the topic, I would have to, um, I'd have to get into that more, but that's my position yeah. sure. broadly stated. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm sure like getting in the weeds of the minutia, as you say, of the details of like, what, what stage are we talking about of the pregnancy? Is it fetus, the baby yet? Like, and those are all the same conversational tracking that happens within the Christianity, as you know, from growing up in the faith Certainly. Um, around season and just around the topic in general whenever people I feel very passionate and have the opportunity to give their views about abortion so let's move on because we've talked about politics a little bit we've talked about faith a little bit let's go into sex friendship and sexuality and you also gave us a little bit of your thoughts about sexuality um, but before getting in there can we start with friendship like you talked about the idea of suffering, and I'm very curious about what, how do Buddhists view, how, or how do you view Buddhism 
as being an individual moving amongst other individuals? Like, do you see a community that naturally will just evolve? Um, and what does that mean in terms of connecting with people? And when people move away, when you talk about suffering, when people die, like what, how, how does Buddhism, um, from your understanding, view relationships, in particular friendships? Mm. That's a great question. So um, I had to give, I definitely got, gave some thought to this. Um, but so with regard to friendships, uh, I've certainly had friends in my life uh, who have uh, moved away for one reason or another, uh, people I've worked with who are all the way across the country now. Um, and for me, in my personal experience, uh, one thing that comes up with this uh, in my mind is uh, reincarnation, the, uh, the belief in reincarnation. Um, Buddhists all uh, do have some, you know, differences in terms of how they parse whether or not uh, the individual ego uh, persists after death. Um, so if you are the same kind of person after you die, when you reincarnate into um, another, uh, you know, another body, does a part of you persist? And, you know, so that's a very uh, interesting topic for me. I personally fall on the side that they do persist after death. So for loved ones, in my my view, for loved ones who uh, die, um, I will see them again. And that kind of comes up in conversation with my mother, who uh, uh, we talk when we talk about family members who have died. I do often say that uh, I will see that person again, um, but I will see them uh, through you. I will see them through you, Joy. Uh, I will see them through uh, uh, someone else in my life who I, I see a, a very similar uh, presence with, uh, that I get something similar, uh, a similar kind of personality to. And, and it's not just their personality or just the memory of them. I believe that um, that person is passing on into a new life, and I will befriend them again. Uh, my father in this life could be my best friend in the next. I might not see them. And throughout the recurring lives, uh, I will meet new friends who are, in fact, old friends. And it's going to be a uh, a reconnection one way or another. There's often times that we have these kinds of moments of deja vu when we meet someone and it feels like I've known you before, that kind of thing. Um, that's not a rock solid evidence for, you know, reincarnation, which I'm not particularly interested in giving rock solid evidences for. But for me, uh, friendship is 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 certainly uh, something that comes to mind when I think of, or reincarnation is something that comes into mind with, uh, with uh, friendships. Um, yeah. Nice. And so how does that also move in terms of, so I'm going to go right into sex just because I know that we are um, losing our time here. And I really want to hear what a Buddhist perspective is because um, you over and over talk about suffering. And so we know that, um, well, maybe not everyone knows, but there is actually a rise of HIV AIDS. Um, and not only among um, the young adults. So I think it's um, somewhere between 18 to 24, um, 30 mark, but there's also a rise within the elder group. And so when we talk about suffering, we're talking about sex and we're talking about friendships and relationships and, and how they may um, um, become something else um, so you don't really lose it and you want to avoid suffering. How, how do you understand Buddhists to can to conduct their expression of what they know of themselves in terms of sex and sexuality, and how does suffering get in turn? How does suffering um, in terms of losses of relationships um, or any type of loss within um, those expressions? Can you speak to that and to some degree? Yeah, certainly. Um, I would. It would seem to me that uh, HIV is is probably rising in. Um uh you know uh elder people because uh you know when people begin to express themselves in a in a a gay relationship um back in like the 70s you know uh contraception was less readily available as it is today uh so and they probably persisted being uh gay throughout their lifetime and so hiv uh you know having having uh, had hiv uh as they got older you know therefore they still have hiv but you know they're a part of the new demographic which it gets counted that way um but <clears throat> with regard to suffering uh i think uh for my uh personal views uh with relationship to sexuality and 
uh, Buddhism, uh, it would seem to be uh, a very terrible uh, suffering indeed to um, try to curb your own sexuality or deny it completely uh, because that would in insist on a necessarily in internal uh, great amount of suffering. Um, and when people do that, they, they can get into all kinds of difficult situations related to suffering, uh, breaking off a marriage because they weren't being true to themselves and feel now to be true to themselves uh, and so have to end that marriage. But they were closeted because of probably uh, outside factors. So for me, uh, any first people who want to express themselves uh, between two or more consenting adults, yeah, I think I said that right. Uh, between two or more consenting adults, uh, you know, that is perfectly legitimate as a form of uh, sexuality uh, because that's just how they're expressing themselves in the most honest way that they can. And that would seem uh, to me to be uh, very much a negation of, of suffering. At the same time, there's also, of course, the discussion uh, to be had uh, around uh, safe sex as well, um, which could drastically, which will drastically reduce uh, HIV uh, people. Um, so it would seem to me that regardless of the possible worry that um, people might have revolving uh, uh, around HIV, it would be, uh, which in the suffering that caused, it would be a much greater suffering in my view to deny yourself of the fullest expression of yourself. Hmm, interesting. And let me um, just go back. That's very interesting. Um, I will go back to that point, but let me just yeah. clarify about that the elder contraction of HIV AIDS. Um, it's actually not, the rising rates are not among gay elders, but it's among heterosexual elders that are living and habitating um, uh, spaces, such as assistant living homes um, or um, retirement places and retirement homes or facilities. Um, and so you see um, men and women who are you know, they have had their prime of children, so that is not a risk. And so practicing safe sex is not necessarily um, something that is in the front and being tested for HIV AIDS is also not something being tested because there is this myth that is carried that I'm um, beyond that. Um, mm -hmm. And so it really, um, really does go against what are the stereotypes of who gets HIV AIDS and how yeah. do they get it. Hmm. That's um, and one, yeah, and, um, and amongst the younger group, we see that it's an act of um, not only unsafe sex that's being practiced, but it's, um, it's risky behavior that surrounds the sexual acts um, that, that leads them to practice unsafe um, sex. Um, so the risky behaviors is drinking, alcohol, um, being around drugs, or taking drugs, doing drugs, um, the risky behavior of, um, it, it, there's a ton of different behaviors, but those are the main ones, um, injecting drugs or um, opioids, sharing needles. Um, and again, it has to do with this mentality of like, I can, some of it has to do with the mentality of I'm invincible, but some of it has to do with and this is how they are dealing with some of the trauma that has been done to them. Mm. Um, so this is the way that they are acting out um, for healing purposes. So this idea of suffering that you say, mm. um, like even what I heard, like even though we can look, there's a ton of other STDs and STIs that can be contracted. I just use AIDS, HIV as one. But what I hear you say is that even though that causes terrible grief and suffering, what is more um, at risk is to deny oneself the ability to express oneself in, in this way. Is that what I hear? Yeah, I would definitely say so. Wow, so there is a hierarchy of choices that it sounds like that you make as a Buddhist based on what is the perceived level of suffering. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it seems like it is a very individual approach in that it would be very difficult to um, bring someone to enlightenment and impose on them your views of what is what it means to suffer mm -hmm. and what it means to suffer to different degrees based mm -hmm. on your perception of 
what the what's at risk yeah is and, that and something that i take into consideration too is is uh you know suffering uh at, for me would might not be suffering for that person or their you know their categories of suffering would be different so that's also to be taken into consideration um but uh um <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, there was a question behind what you were saying just then. Could you give that to me? Again? Restate it. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I was. Oh, I'm sorry. I just remembered. I just remembered. Oh, so. Yeah. So yes. Um, yes, it, it is. It is very uh, individual as to your opinions on all kinds of things like politics, sex, and and uh, so on and so forth. And I recently reached out to someone who um, uh, is a, a contemporary person who teaches about. Buddhism, I will uh, kind of shout them out, which is uh, Secular Dharma, which is uh, a fantastic resource for someone who wants to learn about Buddhism. Uh, so I recently reached out to the person who's behind Secular Dharma, and uh, Dharma, by the way, just means teaching, um, but uh, reached out to them, and I asked them about some of the peculiarities of my own theology and how they relate to God and things like that, and their response to me was, uh, it really doesn't I think they genuinely said that it really doesn't matter. And, uh, you know, it could definitely be taken the wrong way. But upon later inspection, I think I what I realized was that your particular opinions on uh, what, what have you about God or uh, so on uh, are immaterial in terms of uh, uh, reaching enlightenment. And uh, anyone can reach enlightenment uh, practically no, no matter uh, what, what their uh, opinions are on or are on most things. It, it is immaterial that um, in that way. Th that being said, that that is why that it's so individualistic in terms of uh, what kind of uh, opinions you can have about certain things. Right. Yeah. Which is very different than the contrast that you started with talking about Southern Baptists, which has, mm -hmm. from my understanding and from my experience being in different churches, has a very clear threshold and division between what you believe and what you don't believe and what it means to get into salvation. I mean, what is what it means uh, to have salvation, which is a belief in Jesus Christ, which is what I was taught, but I have come to know that even that is fluid among many Christians. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Southern Baptists, uh, they, they baptize, they don't sprinkle, uh, they believe in hell. Um, and we have potlucks, like that's doctrine. And if you disagree with it, then you know, you're pretty much out, but yeah, I, I, I got the same kind of spiel too. <laughs> well, Logan, thank you so much for sharing your views with me and with all those that have taken the time to listen. I've enjoyed this immensely. And I know there's so much more that we could have talked on that we could have um, rifted off of. And so I invite anyone who is looking at this to bring your comments into the conversation. Um, ask clarifying questions, give your input on what was said, what you heard, and let's dialogue about it. Because um, that's what this platform is for. It's not to say who's right, who's wrong. It's just to have really good, honest conversation. And hopefully that honest conversation will help us live our best life possible. So thank you again, Logan. Thank you for having me. And I really appreciate it. Yes, it was my honor to be able to do this with you. Um, and thank you also for doing it online because originally we were going to do it in person and then I just was not feeling well and you were like, no problem. So thank you for your Buddhist approach <laughs> to, to not causing suffering. All right. Well, good night, everyone. Um, and I'll wait the next video. Thank All you. right. Love you. Bye. Bye.